the grand plan was that I will be an ice cream wala. <laughs> that was smoke random things like uh, ganja and all of that. So none of that has come true. <laughs> <laughs> Arogya Setu was a very, very crazy, intense and interesting project overall. Right. So like Make My Trip is your friendly neighborhood Kirana guy. Uh -huh. you making is what really designers enjoy doing. Folks, welcome to Spark Plug. My name is Vivek Verma and I'm a program manager with Google. Well, today we are talking to a design leader known for his disrupting work for Arogya Setu, Make My Trip and Go Ibibo, a co-founder of one of the biggest design conferences in South Asia, which is Design Up. Jai Datta, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Jai, um, before we get into the details uh, about uh, user experience as such and your journey, we just wanted to understand a little bit about yourself, uh, your childhood, how did it start off. Uh, if you can give a little bit, uh, uh, talk a little bit about your background, that will really help us. Sure. No, thanks, thanks, Vivek. So I think um, the grand plan was that I will be an ice cream wala. <laughs> that was that was how I started. So um, I Gujarat in Gujarat, in so it's hot climate and it's very well known for its ice cream. So my childhood dream was to grow up and be an ice cream seller. Uh, but also part of it was to consume a lot of ice creams while being a seller. That was my naivety kind of thing. But being in Ahmedabad also I was surrounded by a lot of great architecture. So Louis Kahn, B.V. Doshi, wow. uh, Corbusier. I mean, we were in so many of those buildings overall. So sometimes visiting IIM, uh, there is this place called Sanskar Kendra or Tagore Hall and so on and so forth. So these are like all done by the greats. Uh, modernist, brutalist, uh, all sorts of architecture that you would see. And lots of um, work done for the Calico Museum and its, its uh, founders which is also done by these greats. So I think many of them were at a later stage, accessible and all of that. So the second plan was to be an architect. And oh. so that, that is how I ended up. It's just that um, my father, of course, knew a lot of friends. He had a lot of friends in NID. And I used to see a lot of people who were, the moment you saw these people who were dressed kind of slightly not the normal with long hair and unshaven and all of that, you knew they were the NID students. In Ahmedabad, they were easy to tell at that point of time when I was growing up. And I was also warned that, hey, you should buy my father's friend, that you should not become, uh, you should not go to design school and all of that. You will become a hippie, you will <laughs> grow long hair, which is uh, which has not exactly come true. I wish I had long hair. And uh, of course, uh, smoke random things like uh, ganja and all of that. So none of that has come true. Um Ulta, I've become a corporate guy <laughs> with no hair almost. Um, so, so I think it was at some point that I said design is the way to go. And uh, of course, I used to draw. I used to um, draw lots of things. And that was one of my childhood passion. It's just a... And typically what parents think is that if you can draw, then you should become either a designer or, or something. Of course, those times, signboard painter was also an option. Uh, <laughs> so, so who knows, kind of. So eventually I ended up in NID. Uh, apparently, a, a, a classmate of mine remembers we did a trip from school to NID and I just fell in love with this beautiful building, um, so green. Uh, so I think... Yeah, then NID happened. I was a day scholar and uh, yeah, walked out of NID at some point in time. It's been a long time, several decades since. Um, so yeah, that was the start, really. So Jay, um, user experience, when it comes to user experience, uh, everyone whom I talk to, like most of the people who are not part of the design industry as such, they have got a very different definition of user experience. Right. Would you help breaking that um, for our audience in a way that they understand what user experience is all about? Sure. Actually, interestingly, the term didn't exist when I walked out of my design school after graduation. It didn't exist. Um, 
in 2000s or, or 99, etc., the, the typical term or before that, the term was HCI, human computer interaction. Uh, then came all sorts of very fancy terms, um, information architect, usably an, usability analyst, um, lots of like terms like auditors, architects, the other established professions were married to certain digital terms and terminologies. And um, the, the term which stuck for a fairly long time was experience design. The, the word UX goes back fairly long. I think Don Norman coined it, um, I think in the 80s pretty much. But I think it took a long time before the acceptance really started. Um, today, people refer to it, as you rightly said, everyone pretty much talks about UX. For me, um, the secret is that UX can exist outside of screens. Right. Actually, it exists outside of screens. I think um, that's our usual thing. Like you go to a cafe, you sit down, you order food. What was the sum total of the experience of being in the cafe? It's not just the food. It's the waiter, their behavior, how the menu was, um, how was the AC, how was the food quality. Everything kind of comes together. Right? We tend to generally act, um, relate user experience to our digital interactions. That's right. Yeah. But I think that's not the only case. That's not the only case. I think if you're going, if you're taking a train, if you're taking, a, if you're traveling out, travel is a great one because in travel you're totally immersed in the experience. It's an experiential uh, sort of um, enjoyment that you have. So experience is everywhere, and and what we're trying to do is modulate that experience. The only thing is that again got up in the morning, wore a shirt, that there was an experience of wearing the shirt and you know, whatever kind of, right? Now, we don't pay attention to it because you never needed a user manual to wear a shirt. Right. But if you were wearing a dhoti, then I'm sure you would need a user <laughs> manual So for that. Now, so hota ye uske baad hai ki things like um, computers, things like, uh, like if you look at some of these ultra-luxury cars, maybe they have 70 features and you probably need a kind of manual yes. or you need to see something on YouTube to figure out ki achha, wo anti-collision wala button turn off karna hai to kahan pe kahan hai, pe sort hai. of thing, ha, right? Ha. So these are things which we are not used to. So this is where when we talk about designing user experiences, we talk about designing user experiences for digital sort of realms or digital environments. But typically even a restaurant uh, or or anyone typically designs experience without thinking about it. For example, um, if you see cheaper cafes or cafes where they want quicker turnarounds or a McDonald's, typically you will see the seats are not very comfy. They are hard. Right. Because they don't want you to sit for two hours. <laughs> <right? laughs> so, so that is, someone has designed that experience as well. Wow. Now we're calling it, okay, let's call that service design versus user experience design. But yeah, it's a sum total is the user experience. So that's a very interesting perspective because so they want the inflow of traffic at the same time. They don't want it. So generally, it's a small, cozy place. Most yeah. of the McDonald's are subways of the world, right? Yeah. So they just want you to come in, take your stuff and then move out so that you have in, they have enough space for others to come in. Yeah. It's a very interesting perspective. I never thought, you know, why is the <laughs> the the seat so hard? Yeah, I think it's a little colder. It's a little hard. Whereas if you look at certain cafes or certain upmarket restaurants, they are very comfortable. They're nice and warm and comfortable. And so they want you to spend more time because the more time you spend, the more food you eat and the more bill it kind of accrues. Right. So I think different business models um so this is different like you have those very small darshanis right again bangalore is known for that where you don't even have seats you are standing huh. and you're eating i was just telling my wife the other day that we should have one of these things in the in our balcony where we stand and eat so you get a darshini feeling <laughs> <laughs> but that's the idea you turn around faster but that's an amazing perspective of a user experience um, Jay, one thing which comes to my mind is that a lot of people, uh, especially students who are actually on the cusp of taking a professional course, say mostly in their 10th and 12th, um, they kind of ask me that what does it take to get into a design college? But before that, see, we have general conventions set. For example, if I am good in maths in class 10, generally, if you go by the normal convention, I would take up science. 
Yeah. If I am good in biology in twelfth, I would definitely prepare for medical. That's the general mindset. I mean. Yeah. But how does one identify now that design is an upcoming field, right? How does one identify that you have the skills and the aptitude to actually go for it? What are the key indicators at that juncture of life which you can look forward to and then take a call? I mean, just looking at it at from a very conventional lens. Sure. So I just wanted to understand from you what what's your take on that? No, I think um, typically it's a very standard and a very first level correlation, like you said. Maths, then you should go for sciences or tech or engineering. And anyway, we have a super bias for engineering and medical uh, sort of uh, areas per se. Um, if you're good at art and you are terrible at maths, then you should go for design. That's the, or or something yeah. like that. Uh, or so I think that is a usual bias. But what I'm sure you are seeing as well is a lot of engineers have shifted into design. Right. Because it's almost like so. I used to have a friend who's who's done his uh, bachelor's from Cambridge. And he kind of uh, told his parents that, listen, you have wanted me to do the sciences and, you know, physics and all sorts of complicated stuff. It's done. I am now going to do design. And uh, obviously, it's pretty much similar with our generations, generations who are younger out here because parents have a certain wish that you should do this. Uh, but I also see people who I have interviewed, like they probably graduated and it took them six years before realizing that, design is what they should pursue. And they've probably gone and done chemical engineering from the IIT and then set up some bottling plant and did something and all sorts of things. And until one day they stumble upon their roommate doing game design and say, what does this, what does it mean? And they said, this is actually, I'm very good at this and I really enjoy it. Now, so, so saying that you're bad at maths and good at drawing as a correlation of design is also wrong. I think the real thing is that do you enjoy working in creating something, making something? And I think that making is what really designers enjoy doing. It's a thing that does not exist. I'm going to sort of make it. I'm going to make it happen. Um, and if you are someone who's enjoyed making things from scratch um, as a kid, even now, and with making comes a lot of uncertainty. So a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty. If you can handle ambiguity, if you can handle uncertainty, if you enjoy making things, uh, because there will be a lot of failures on the way. So if you can deal with that, then design could be a great profession for you. And if you have, so, so a lot of designers are actually pretty bad at, at drawing, for example. I know a lot of designers right. who are like that. A lot of designers, and especially with UX becoming so big, um, they... We also need people who are who have a logical bent of mind, who can connect more dots, who understand how do you balance technology to make something good come out. So their making becomes much more sharper, much more focused. So I think those guys are also very much in in demand increasingly. Uh, the type, the creative, the craft, arts and crafts type that you used to think about earlier, that's still there. That's still always going to be. Uh, but that's not really the focus of design anymore. Design has moved from being the beautifier of things to making things useful, usable, or even discovering product market fit. Mm. So I think this is where design's fundamental definition has changed in today's world as well. Why design, why you can increasingly work in a Google or Microsoft or Atlassian or any of these large companies which was earlier only open for techies, for instance. Right. But now suddenly design is a big thing in right. all of these places. Okay? Yeah. And of course, Apple has something to do with it. So, <laughs> 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 On the other aspect of, so now that I know that I have the aptitude or I have the interest or the inclination, how do I go about picking design as a career, as in, you know, when I'm on, when I have completed my 12th, uh, how do I select the colleges? How do I go about getting, acquiring those skills? Um, how do I actually also, one more question was that, how do I start prepping for these colleges? Because I understand that the um, entrances for NID and some of the top notch um, design colleges in India, it's becoming tougher and tougher. Yeah. So what's your 
take on that and also would you able to help us with some of the good design colleges both in india and abroad which someone can pursue sure so i think um prepping and understanding so one is to understand that you want to go into design and typically um there are many fields in design so you could be doing set design for instance you could be doing um exhibition design you could be doing design for automobiles um UX design uh, again a lot of UX could be consumed within automobiles as well but i think there are i mean you just think about UX as an area graphic and communication design which is one of the oldest fields of design textile design which is different from fashion uh, and india has a huge advantage a huge legacy in textile design um which is the actual fundamental um creation of fabrics creation of materials per se so there are people doing that as well uh then of course there's fashion design accessory design jewelry design there are so many areas that you can go into um today everyone seems to be heading more for the ux because everyone thinks and especially i'm sure parents think that this is a great place to be right. my daughter or son will earn as much as an engineer etc cetera, etc cetera. but having said that where does your aptitude lie because we have a great number of people who are very good fashion designers accessory designers all sorts of thing people who make watches uh and 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 so on so i think is there something that you have an aptitude or a knack for like i know someone who always had a knack for automobile design mm-hmm. and pretty much went there that this is their passion so i have uh, this this a uh, couple of friends of mine who are pretty much stuck to that their whole life they love motorbikes so they love cars and that's what that's what they're deeply into so it's almost like saying that even if they got paid half of what they are getting paid they or or even a tenth of it i'm sure they would still do it they do it for the love of doing it and i think that's where your work shines and and all of it so one is to identify where do you want to go and keep money aside would you still do it because right. in some ways i feel uh, ux has peaked right now because it's it's so much kind of being talked about and everyone's getting into it that there are less places than the number of graduates getting out kind uh, of and and okay. so that's that's where the whole problem is that's that's an interesting perspective so so my feeling is it's peaked there are so many of these uh, boot camps which you will see around yeah anything from 99 rupees to 499 yeah. to then it's like a pyramid scheme somewhere kind of that you right. get stuck into that uh some of them are good as well they're not that but it's more vocational in nature that i will kind of get you a set of skills and tomorrow you can get plugged in into some company and then you figure out what you want to do whereas what we're talking about is careers having said that um i know a lot of uh industrial designers that's again one of the other older sort of professions within design um a lot of industrial designers people who used to do do physical products um and they get really pissed off when we talk about product design <laughs> as digital product design but a lot of these people have moved into digital product design right. for instance a lot of architects have moved into product design uh digital product design and so on so there's service design which is the more new fangled of the lot as well there's user research which is again big and you will see a lot of people coming from psychology and other behavioral sciences into user research as well because they're combining different um sort of areas and and mixing and matching some of these so so the second thing to ask yourself is where do you want to go in design if design is your passion or was the passion something like x like creating physical products i want to do like lamps i want to do sort of radios whatever that is um then of course comes the question of which college because certain colleges are known for certain things mm. um so for example if i think about um communication industrial textiles animation there's animation as well right. i would definitely think about nid as being one of the top notch schools out there um is it for ux i would probably put iit guwahati kind of somewhere out there Okay. it's really good in terms of digital design ux and and so on and so forth so there are different areas which are good at different things having said that i think what you need is a rigorous grounding in design a lot of context of design history of design how does it all come and that will help you switch on things i mean you can switch from one to the other and then realize that and this happens i mean when you are 19 20 and you're just kind of getting into something you are half formed 
in terms of your thoughts you kind of do certain things and your your thoughts form better and better um some of the universities of course nid has been there for a very very long time there's iit idc in mumbai right iit guwahati is very good it's relatively new of the other iits from a design perspective actually even iit delhi and kanpur have design so this is the iit and the the older established kind of uh, places the problem now is there are way too many design schools exactly so <laughs> there are i keep hearing about design school propping up every now and then and someone inviting to me to be part of their um, whatever board of studies or something and and i still don't know how do i kind of how good or bad they are some of them which i know have been around for a decent number of time or they are young but they are doing the right thing um there is um jklu i think lakshmipath university jk lakshmipath university in jaipur which has a, a program in design i actually helped them design their curriculum for a wow. new age um communication design curriculum what does it mean in the in the new world because i feel a lot of design now should be about writing as well right and uh, it's not just doing the usual kind of whatever we thought about um there is uh, one in pune flame university they have just about recently launched but this is a very interdisciplinary liberal arts uh, influenced design so they've got some very good faculty members as well uh there are a bunch of other ones like mit in pune symbiosis has a good design institute right there is one here in bangalore srishti, srishti. institute of design i think it's now srishti manipal institute of design yeah. these are the ones which i know about i am i know there's one in coimbatore one couple of nids have cropped up as well kurukshetra bhopal uh, again no idea uh, in terms of what's happening there but this would be like new a brand new sort of institute do you person. sense that um, the uh, demand i mean the supply is way more than the demand I think especially people have yeah sorry please you were saying something yes yeah, so especially yeah. um i mean going in in next 5 years now that we have got so many institutes which have come up um do you do you think that's happening or 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 or, or it's in the cusp of happening i think it is already over uh it's over already the top. okay uh because one is that there are um too many people have sensed an opportunity in the space and before the space space matures and before the space kind of um uh what's the word for it kind of peaks and goes over i think it takes time to put together a curriculum time to sort of physically sort of execute it a place and all of that so i think this is where my feeling is that there are too many design institutes oh in my list earlier i forgot to mention another good one uh, iia the indian institute of art and design in delhi they have actually got some very good courses also in interior design and, wow. and stuff like that apart from the the usual regular ones so coming back you are right i think my feeling is that maybe it has peaked or maybe the ux bit has peaked there is i definitely think there's enough scope for other areas like physical product design uh, if you think about digital product design generally for india uh, and uh, i happen to have worked in a vc so i could see the transition so if you think about it 10 years ago the the thing would be i want to do create the x of us in india so i want to create um let's put it whatever kind of whatever was the x the 10 years ago let's say i want to do the netflix of us in india mm-hmm. but now the thing is that increasingly indians are creating unique product niches for themselves like if you think about your phone pay and paytm and all of that these are very uniquely indian there is no paytm or a phone pay equivalent partly because there is no upi and that whole ecosystem on which it is based in the us mm-hmm. uh google pay of course was also one of the early sort of movers in that space now so there are like if you look at swiggy and zomato uh, if you look at a lot of these kind of places these have got their own unique indian strengths i mean right. uh, and characteristics right now i can for example if you see the physical product design you if you've seen that sare gama or whatever that radio which yeah, is there yeah 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 i think that's a that's a great idea yeah. in terms of for 
elders, a whole bunch of nostalgic old time songs right. and all of that, and right. they can play around with it. It's a it's a kind of a digital physical product right. design. I think there still aren't so many of those uniquely Indian product physical product designs yet. So I think there is a space for product designers, the physical product designers, to go out there and create something for India. Right. Textiles we have been always good at. Fashion we have been good at. Um, but things like interiors, for example, we don't talk much about it, or it's a realm of architecture rather than design per se. Uh, car design, I think that's taken off. I mean, automobile design has taken off in India. It was not so much an Indian thing, but suddenly it is becoming. So bikes and, you know, small two-wheelers and, uh, you know, anything you name it. So there are sectors in which there are a lot of opportunities. Right. But this whole kind of rush towards the UX gold mine, I think that mine is depleting. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jay, that also makes me think that in that case, um, is then does it become really important for a student to get in some of these branded institutes, which kind of also ensure certain level of job security? Because then if you're getting into an IIT um, or an NID, you know that there would be a lot of company who would come for placements and you have an opportunity to get into the corporate uh, world a little bit easier than some of the other colleges, yep. right? That entry bar kind of lowers down. What's, true, true. what's what's your take on that? I think it's always good to go for a great institute. I think given anyone given a chance would always go for a really good one uh, or whatever they think is the best in their area or field. Um, two reasons. One is, of course, the first push that they get when you're out there. So when you, let's say a whole a few thousand people graduate in a year and you're all out there looking for jobs, chances are that uh, you're an idea, you might be a very average student, a very average grad versus someone who graduated from a completely unknown college but is amazing with the skills and mm -hmm. all of that. But unless you can prove it, the first thing that I see on your CV might give a preference to someone from NIT. Right. And once you go through the whole kind of process in the industry, then you realize, no, 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 that is not good enough. Maybe this was was better guy, kind of, right? And this is what we're realizing a lot more increasingly kind of thing. Um, the other thing, which is also great to have that institute connection is, of course, the, the network that you built. And some students are going somewhere. And, and, and these are like, your IIT networks are very, very famous. Right. Right? Like, like IIT Bombay is very, very well known. So I think it's knowing each other, knowing you, knowing opportunities, kind of creating those opportunities, opening doors. Those are super helpful. So if you had a choice uh, between the top and not so top, I would definitely say, yes, go for the top. Okay? Huh. <laughs> the other way of putting it would be like, if I don't get into the top, but I yeah. still have the passion. Right. Should I go for two tire and three tire colleges is the question. Yeah, I think. I would say if you have the passion, if you have the motivation, if you have the tenacity, um, you should definitely go for tier two, tier three. But remember, it will make the work a little more harder. That's the way I would see it. So Jay, the next question which comes to my mind is that assuming that someone who has that passion and interest but somehow he or she is not able to get into the tier one college, the IITs and the NIDs of the world. In that case, should they go ahead with tier two or tier three college or should they rethink about their career choices? I think um, if you have the passion, if you are super motivated, willing to work hard, then it shouldn't matter so much. Uh, if you think about it, uh, earlier years, in, in decades and centuries earlier, there used to be no colleges and you had apprenticeships. You actually had to work and work and work under a master and you would, it's still there, by the way, it's still there very much in Japan and parts of Europe, still very much exists. In Even in our craft tradition, it very much exists, right? So you will have to go through that grunge work, you will have to learn the ropes and, and so on and so forth. But if you're motivated, I think you will get there. The Interesting part is that in the UX world, a lot of people have not even gone to design schools and they are they are doing really well. 
that's probably suited for a very specific area of work but in the broader scale of design that may not always work you might have to go back and and pick up certain skills or certain crafts and and so on and so forth so i would still say why not if you if you have the motivation if you are willing to work hard and put in the extra hours then yeah awesome the next thing which comes is that once you have gone into a college right uh, obviously you have acquired the skills you have taken the degree and you're looking forward to get into the professional like, like you know the professional world get into a good company everyone dreams of getting into yeah. a good company and i'm sure you have been part of a lot of many campus hirings right right so i wanted to understand from that perspective that what do you look for in these bright candidates who have actually come to you for an interview um how do you assess what what goes in your mind when you talk to them right so i think just to step back a little uh when we graduated uh we didn't have many people who would hire us right. in the sense there were not big companies hiring there was no google then and no facebook and no amazon at that point in time and not many people were hiring designers and um not that it bothered us at all because typically what would happen is designers would create their own studios and certain studios would grow very big and they in turn would hire designers so we had a fairly self sufficient ecosystem and you never really looked for mostly if you didn't never, never look for a job outside of that studio ecosystem what has happened in the last maybe 15 to 20 years is that ecosystem has broken apart or some of these studios have been acquired by a company by um, a consulting company and so on and so forth so so for example um uh, like a mckinsey is acquiring something or any of these kind of not just a not just an amazon or a google or anyone so this has happened or oh, this change has happened so therefore a lot more designers are looking for jobs and the jobs are fairly cushy these days and they promise you a lot more chance to travel the world do some very deep product work and so on so obviously everyone wants to go for a job and not so much the agency and agency could also be ad agencies for instance with their design practices um typically and, and yeah i think um i can't remember maybe this i would say estimate a few thousands of people that have gone through kind of the portfolios and cvs and so on uh, uh, so typically what you're looking for in in anything any of them so for example you might first see the cvs or you might be given a bunch of 20 cvs or 30 cvs and then you go through them and say which one do you want which portfolios do you want to see or who do you want to shortlist etc so sometimes it's just purely on the cv and uh, what you're looking for is is certain things not being there like for example spelling mistakes or very long winded descriptions of things and a cv which goes into three pages or two pages um what you're looking for is a succinct cv uh, something which is nicely beautifully designed takes into account that the person's time is short so can i actually put down things so it's easy to digest um does it have something which stands out mm. it could be a design it could be the typography it could be anything pretty much um very clear indication of where the portfolio is is it an online portfolio where will i find the portfolio mostly it's online now um having said that i do see a lot of people who send cvs or who share cvs which is like a bunch of 21 jpegs or like 17 jpegs and 3 pngs and 3 gifs kind of thing which is like a like what's what's wrong kind of like i have to collate everything or it is actually a google drive in which you go or it is a figma thing which needs a password to open etc etc so again here is a test of how are you thinking about the other person who's reading mm-hmm. your or seeing your cv i mean how are you doing it a lot of people have also moved into things like for example medium and their cv or their portfolios are like small case studies on medium which is also good uh, very often you don't have the time to read but you would just quickly glance through that and you know the bigger problem area etc um a lot of them are found in behance and dribble behance is a certain format typically so what also happens is that people start following a template and the template after a point becomes very boring so you're looking for someone to break the template and very often i don't see people breaking the template the template would be this is the background this is the user research i did this is this is this is it's almost um 
1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal to 4 kind of what I'm looking for is 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal to 7 mm -hmm. and that's a hard one to put but that's where that creativity and thinking from the user perspective comes into play pretty much. The other question and which is what I advise a lot of um, students especially fresh out of college is that they might say hey these are all the projects I did in college and these are all the projects which I put on out there but you will see some obvious issues with those projects. So the question is did you not pick it up and they say yeah we picked it up we realized it during our final year jury or final year whatever exam we realized that there were some errors so why did you not go back and change them and put it up? Why did, have you put it up with those obvious kind of issues? That's the first big question. And that's a big red flag. The second thing is that you worked on, let's say, five or seven projects in the last couple of years. But what stopped you from doing something more? Why did you not do a self-initiated project? Mm -hmm. And uh, self-initiated projects are actually a great way to showcase what you are capable of. I think what all recruiters are looking for is some sort of an indication that if I hire this person, then I'll be making a bet in a person who's who can take my area of work or whatever further, kind of, right? And many hiring managers are not capable of seeing a long arc. They probably see like, okay, I'm in travel, so did this person work on travel and is it... Whereas a lot of work can actually be very fungible, very relatable. If I've done something in X, I can translate that into Y. And you're looking for those people who have, whose fundamentals are pretty strong, who have got a decent degree of craftsmanship and skills and all of that, but who can think well, who can add up those one plus one equal to three sort of things. And those are the kind of people you're looking at. And that's the spark that you're looking at. That's the spark that I look for and I would love to bet on those people mm -hmm. that's pretty much the way I would put it right um, you talked about uh, some of the areas where the person you, you ask these questions generally um, whether you know something went wrong with the project and then you know um, did you realize it and then if that was the case why did you not correct it would it also just thinking out loud here um would you also not like to um, understand the failure aspect and the fact that the person has realized it's a failure and still wants to showcase the failure to you because that's kind of a thing, saying that, look, I've learned from it, but I still want to tell you that I failed here. Um, what's, what's your perspective on that? I think a lot of people have that. They probably are. They probably talk about, hey, this is, I know this is wrong. And uh, some people probably don't take it very seriously or don't realize that it was such a big deal or it's not a, technically it's not a big deal. It's just a project that you were doing, a hypothetical project you were doing. The world did not fall apart. It's okay, absolutely fine. But it's how do you understand, recognize failure and what do you do about it? Do you recognize it and talk about it proactively? And I think part of the reason why people don't want to talk about it proactively is it gives them maybe some sort of a negative marking. So I can completely understand that why people may not want to talk about it proactively. Uh, but I think I do delve into failures and, and stuff like that. And I think it tells a lot about a person. Like, how do you handle failure? Because we deal with so much failure all around in projects and things and, you know, um, everywhere else. You need to pick yourself up and get on going with it. So yeah, failure, very, very important to... Uh, in my perspective, to discuss, to be honest and open about it uh, and doesn't definitely give you negative markings from my worldview. But I do understand that it might put people a little not sure. So, so yeah, that's my take on it. Jay, one question that comes to my mind, especially talking about these interviews, see, one is the, uh, the technical aspects, you know, the design bent and the fact that uh, how good is he or she in solving a problem and things which you talked about. The other aspect is also, how do you evaluate that the person has rigor? Yeah. And he will give it all what it takes. Right. Yeah, that's the harder one. And typically it works well when you are actually discussing this over a little longer period of time. 
you had a time to think about the last conversation. And very often in all kind of organizations, people give a design test. Um, a lot of people, of course, are contesting whether we should give design tests or not, but maybe whiteboarding exercises, something on those lines pretty much. Um, again, I do believe in a sixth sense sort of thing, having honed it over the years maybe. But what I try and do is, again, you can call sixth sense a bias also. So it can be a very much a bias. One way to fight that is really get other people to uh, sort of look at the candidate independently. Mm -hmm. So did I see in something which others did not? Maybe was it my bias or what I call sixth sense or, or so on and so forth? So I think it's very important to do a much more holistic analysis. Now, when you are in a campus recruitment situation and you have to tell make a decision by the end of the day or in a couple of hours, Everything comes together very, very in a short while. Again, there I would also kind of pick on the group, uh, largely a small group that goes in here and then sort of talks the candidate in smaller group setups. So maybe two people talking to the candidate, one person talking to the candidate, etc. So you have multiple perspectives coming together. And we pretty much leave our titles aside and, and discuss that this is the person who will be part of our team. What are the sort of things which support that? And what are the things that don't support it? Mm. Certain things, um, and you talked about rigor, which is which is actually the good part. Sometimes people will say, hey, you know what? I thought about this and can I show you something else? I actually did three of these. And, and if you have the time, certainly let's have a quick look at what did you do? So why did you not pick it? And I remember one particular instance where I asked this young girl, why did you not pick it? And uh, she said, well, my, because she showed me the other alternatives and she said, well, my professor then felt was he was very strong that I should do this. And I'm like, no, this doesn't make sense. So I can understand how their thinking must have been influenced during that time. But giving the space for them to articulate, talk about it, show other things, what could have been done. That's a, that's a good way to maybe hone in on the rigor part. Right. Um, Jay, the big bug question now, the thing is that, so once I have, you know, um, acquired the skills and, uh, um, all, you know, got my degree, everyone looks for a, I mean, this is something really important for all of us and that's the, the pay scale. Yeah. Right. Um, so would you be able to give us some insight, especially, uh, in, in these times, um, a fresher who has just got, you know gone out from college and who joins a good company, uh, what would a pay scale look like? Are they at par with some of the other um, um, skills like engineering, like the doctors and some of the other you know key skills that people have, or is design still lagging behind? Design was lagging behind. I would say increasingly it is not. Um, the especially, so there are people who do uh, salary surveys in design and they break it down in terms of, uh, regions like for example, the metro cities versus non-metro disciplines like, um, graphic design, communication design, fashion design, UX and so on and so forth. UX tends to come right at the top because it's in an industry where it is often equated with uh, engineering pay scales. And so UX is, a UXer actually, someone was telling me the other day, UXer earns more than an engineer actually, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are kind of outliers on, on all fronts. But having said that, I could safely say that a, a UX grad or someone who's specializing in UX uh, comes from a decent tier one, tier two city, uh, sorry, uh, tier one, tier two university, could probably make as much as they appear in engineering, right? If not more, right? So, so yeah, I think this is, it has changed quite significantly. Of course, there are the other sort of points, like for example, right now, it's an employer's market where people will try and negotiate down stuff. But yeah, I think average it out, it'll be similar kind of. Right. Um, in my company and in some of the other organizations which I have worked in. I have seen that a lot of people um, who have joined in uh, and are great user experience designers 
actually doesn't hold a degree in design as such. They are lateral entry. Some of them are engineers or maybe, you know, in some of the other skills which they had. And probably they realized one day that, you know, this is my passion and this is where I need to go. And they ended up succeeding. Yeah. What's what's your take on those? Is there a opportunity for laterals to come in? I think so. And uh, I think in every field, there are opportunities for these laterals or outliers or people on the fringes to come in. I'm not sure whether you've seen that, but I think uh, some time back, I think it was Anurag Kashyap who stirred this debate that, um, you know, directors, film directors should not be from FDII and right, film right, schools. Right. They should be from NID, as he was saying. They should not be the film guys typically because they have a different way of seeing things. Right. And this has always been that the outsider sort of angle has always been the case. Should the should the CEO be the outsider who brings in a fresh perspective and completely changes? It works sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. I think this is this is the the rationale. The reason why it works very well for the UX kind of uh, area, and maybe not so much for the other areas, is because a lot of people who have moved into UX design have been in that larger technology field. They understand the technology, they understand the products, they understand the services and the the backends and everything else. And within all of that, they feel that I need to do something which is not this, but make a difference out there. So I think it's a very natural move for them. So I, I definitely think it works well. Uh, the question is that... Um, if their context changes tomorrow, would they still be as comfortable? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But unlikely that they will be moving from, let's say, an Amazon into Pixar. So, so I think we can safely say all is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jay, um, when I started this podcast and when I gave an introduction, that one app which potentially saved millions of people was Arogya Setu. And it's so amazing that you were involved with Arogya Setu and the design aspects of it. What amazing, uh, what amazes me the most is that Arogya Setu was something which was which almost catered to everyone, irrespective of the fact whether the person has is basically a high, you know, it's a proficient internet user or someone who is not so proficient internet user. There was a lot of urgency then, right, to get this yeah. out ASAP. True. Um, so uh, it seems to be a very interesting journey. And first of all, thank you for doing what you have done. Because had you not done that, I'm not sure what would have been the case then. But one thing I was uh, interested in, one, how did you get involved in this? Two, what was your thought process? Because the problem statement looked very complicated. You had to reach out to pro- almost everyone in the country. And you had to also keep in mind, you know, what is that um, something which can easily be grasped yeah. without having a manual, um, you know, and touches every demographics, people of almost um, every age segment, every language, every proficiency level. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, I think Arogya Setu was a very, very crazy, intense, and interesting project overall. Um, when I look back, I wish that we don't have to do it again, ever. Yeah. Uh, the way I got involved was, uh, uh, was a couple of engineers in Make My Trip and Go I Bebo came up with the, the fundamental idea, the technology behind this, which was exactly the same uh, we found out much later from what Apple and Google were saying, in terms of their contact tracing program, it was pretty much so the privacy concerns were addressed and a whole bunch of things. So I think on day two, they kind of involved me and said, this is what we are thinking. And my first question was around privacy and all sorts of things. So we had a long, long discussion. And what we realized is at that point of time, a lot of different companies were trying to help the government build something like this. Uh, So we were not the only ones. And the government was doing a fairly rigorous test in terms of seeing which one A, would kind of scale across so many millions, 600,000, a billion essentially, that we're talking about a 1.4 billion. 
and uh, also sort of take into account all the privacy concerns and everything else had to be ticked off the boxes. So they had also recruited or rather kind of gotten in ICMR. Uh, when I say government, I think there are so many government bodies involved. Uh, there was also IIT Madras, IIT Chennai, um, then Niti Aayog. Uh, everyone was pretty much involved in this project and people were trying, like you said, Urgency was like crazy. Everyone knew that. Uh, no one had to be forced or told. Everyone got it that this has to be done ASAP. Um, the problem that I saw was that this was a very complicated concept. You're talking probability. And uh, probability is so hard even for people who are highly educated to get. Um, I think this is stuff that stock market brokers to risk folks and everyone talks about probabilities. Um, will I will I be infected? 30% chance you won't be infected. 70% chance you would be infected. And the very first version which went out had text given by another government agency which was fairly textual in nature. We already had a bunch of designs which were not that but we wanted to roll out with that first guidance overall. And it was hard to understand. That was day one, day two. By day three, we had put our new design in place. It had also gone to the prime minister and he had seen it and he had made a comment that this is very hard to, which was truth for kind of pretty much everyone. And by the way, this was being released every 24 hours wow. almost. Uh, so we would work in the mornings, the developers would take over in the afternoons and late nights and by 6 a.m. we had something rolled out and again the cycle would start. A wow. lot of learning on the way, so a lot of real feedback on the way and uh, and also a lot of different people coming together. So a lot of different sort of agencies, studios, individuals, someone saying I'll do the illustrations for you, someone saying I'll do the um, translation for you, someone saying I'll do the research for you and so on. So by day three, what we decided was to completely pivot to, and, and this was anyway in the in, in, in the pipeline, into a model which is based on images and colors. And everyone pretty much understands the, the red, the yellow, the green sort of symbolism of, of good, not good, etc. And we also added a gray and all sorts of uh, thoughts that we had. The good part was that we were getting feedback 24 hours so we could and we could change it in 24 hours right. and we had to change it in 24 hours if we got the feedback. Um, the second one was something which was uh, funny and silly and we have encountered that. Those charts where there used to be that Adash Balak kind of uh, thing and <laughs> the Adash Balak gets up at 6 in the morning and brushes his teeth and does pranam to Mataji, Pitaji, all that kind of thing, right? And as kids, we saw that and we would laugh and say, this is like such a stupid thing and all of it. But we said, hey, we got to go back to something which is very pictorial and chart-like and all of that, but still have, be very modern in its approach. And the deeper idea also was personalization. How can we personalize it um, to, to sort of reflect a lot of these, uh, your condition and basis that. So... We brought into effect um, a lot of illustration, which was very Indian in nature, but still very modern. And, and uh, an agency called Obvious helped us in, in that uh, to make that entire group of images per se. And uh, I think that flew, that did very well. Um, but the most used feature was track what's happening around me. And I remember I was having this conversation with uh, Vikalp, who was the heading the project uh, from the technical side. And because our phones were 24-7 on standby and we would call each other at any point in time. And in middle of lunch, we are having this long discussion around this feature. He said, we can potentially track it down to a much closer range, but I don't think we should. And I said, agreed. And, and interestingly, we also had one of the lawyers who was being a big advocate for privacy sort of concerns and all that on board as well. So we would also kind of bounce it off him. And essentially we had a council every day which would bounce off some of these issues and, and come to a conclusion and then quickly move on in the next whatever 16 hours or whatever that we were left with to finish off what had to be done. So we said let's kind of do about a two kilometer or three kilometer minimum radius because that 
would anonymize the data quite a bit because there were concerns about people being asked to leave the apartment blocks or whatever and fear and all sorts of things, right? And that, interestingly, everyone pretty much used. And uh, we did uh, research in Bihar and different places, which was all on phones, and people got it. They understood it. It was simple. Um, it was simple. It was very clean. Uh, it had a lot of images, which was very modern in, in approach. And we kept learning, kept using that pretty much. Um, I always had this in my mind that, um, you know, I always thought that for creativity, you need time. It was a classic case where the time factor was not in the favor, like you had a super sense of urgency. Right. But yet that creativity blossomed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a very interesting case. And also, uh, it also showcases the kind of impact designers can have on the whole society as such. Right. right. Because that app ended up saving literally a lot of lives. Like, remember the advanced versions where you have that tracer, right? Uh, as in, yeah. you can trace people who have been infected in like two kilometers of your radius. And then you would ensure that you are at home and take proper precautions and whatever right. that came with it. So that was an amazing concept in such a short time. So Yeah, I think it was um, the, the whole idea because part of the reason why the government needed the data completely anonymized and completely sort of cleaned up. So you would not be able to trace the individual, but you will be able to trace the larger impact within areas is where do I divert my best people, resources, medicines, testing kits, etc., etc. So if I see clusters happening, which might go red completely, then this is where I need to rush and I need to intervene in some way. So this is this is where I think uh, we also had the backend systems and, and all of that. Again, at a larger, not so much granular data, but a larger kind of anonymized data set per se. And I think this was super helpful. I mean, there were so many debates, like so many things that we did not put in. We also added friction. So one of the things we, uh, which is completely counterintuitive to B2C products, uh, we added friction in terms of, so one of the, the use cases we thought is what if, um, so if you are infected, you have to eventually upload your data to the government. And if you are, uh, I mean, if, if the lab says you're infected and, and so on, so the lab will actually put your phone number and your phone number is now kind of there. Now, what if a kid is playing with the, the parent's phone and by mistake he says upload data and the data goes up? You're not oh, even infected. Right. But why do we want to do that? I mean, we want to prevent accidents like that from happening or even you could do it by mistake. So that was actually added friction in those steps. So, so are you sure? Oh. Are you okay? Would you be okay? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's like completely counterintuitive to, to the, the system, but we added friction. Uh, early days, what we saw also was that um, people would play around with the app because it was almost like the app was fairly simple. There's not much to do in the app initially, at least. And people would, um, so there was a health kind of uh, a questionnaire which was yeah. there. And in the health questionnaire, people would, a lot of people, because a lot of people are not even re reading it or they have no intention of reading it, but they're doing something there. So they're randomly filling up forms. And one of the things we got was that a lot of people in the PM's constituency, Varanasi, uh, looks like it's going to be a big, big, big sort of outbreak area. I think we had certain terms those days for those. And uh, I think a whole mechanism was put into action. 600 people or started calling number of people. So I don't know. They probably called some 2,000, 3,000 people. And the feedback we got was, I was playing around with it. So this seemed to be one of the major. Some people are, of course, kind of sincerely filled it in, but a lot of people. So then again, we put more friction there, saying that, are you sure what you're filled in is right? This is not something to be played around with. Basis right. this, the government will actually kind of put the right resources and the right medicines or people in your location. So before submitting, and again, the other thing was some people would submit it twice or thrice a day. Ah. And this is also, it was like, oh my God, something is happening. Let me just put it and see, am I okay? Am I okay? Kind of thing, right? So we said, hang on, don't kind of keep doing it. Like if you did it now, you won't be able to do it in the next three or six hours, something like that. So we put a lot of friction there to make sure that people are not just randomly doing it. So you got to have an intention of 
like really thoughtfully doing it. Right. So that was quick uh, inferences, quick observations, and quick deployment as well. Sometimes in 24 to 48 hours, wow. everything is kind of done. Wow. So, yeah. That, that's an amazing job, and Jay. And also, I think, um, amazingly, the way the government sort of, I mean, I saw the other side of the government, of course, in this case, um, every day talks with the IES officers and, you know, the PMO staff and, like, it's what they say, elephants can dance. I mean, the speed at which, I mean, we would never leave the meeting without a whole bunch of clear decisions and next steps wow. kind of there. And if there were next steps on, on the PMO, they would make sure that is done within 24 hours. Amazing. We had to do our, our bit, they had to do our bit, everyone had to do their bit. Wow. 24 hours was a deadline kind of. That's, that's so good to hear. Uh, and the fact that there's a lot of teamwork, right? At different yes. levels. At different, totally, yeah. So the collaboration what, like, was at the highest form we one could think of. True. Um, Jay, such a great uh, uh, thing which you have accomplished. Thank you for doing that. Um, and thanks to the whole Arugya Setu team who actually, you know, did everything possible. Um, I think it's one of the landmark apps, probably when we look back, um, which actually ended up helping so many people. But one thing uh, which also comes to my mind is after and before Aroigri Setu, you were in Make My Trip. Yeah. And you were also instrumental in res, uh, in revamping the user experience of Make My Trip. Now, Make My Trip is one of the most used app as far as uh, travel segment is concerned. I mean, the name of the app itself is like people make my trip, make my trip. It's like the yeah. name, the, the travel synonym is kind of like kind of associated with make my trip yeah how did that happen and what were the challenges how did you go about revamping that i think make, make my trip was a very interesting journey as well and very proud of what all the team achieved uh, over the years um actually while i was in flipkart i think there was a lot of conversations with make my trip happening and i was not sure because when you think about it, Flipkart was a relatively new um, company, app, everything, and they had they had done a much better job overall. Whereas when you look at Make My Trip, it was then about 15, 16 years old, a um, lot of legacy stuff, legacy code. Um, I wasn't sure that uh, whether they would let me tear apart and redo a lot of things. Uh, the interesting thing was that I was with a VC uh, who was who also happened to be the people who took Make My Trip to New York Stock Exchange wow. and got them listed. So, so through them, I started doing like coming over to to Make My Trip and spending some time with them and understanding. So, Deep Kalra and and uh, Rajesh Mago, who are the the sort of chairman and and CEO. I kind of realized that they were willing to put the money where their mouth was and they were committing that, you know, we got to change it. I remember Rajesh telling me at one point, I still like the old app. It's very nice and colorful, <laughs> but but I think this is a commit. We have to, we have to redo it because there are a lot of things which are broken here. A lot of things like, for example, there are times when you could not cancel a ticket on right. Make My Trip app. You had to call up the airline or, yeah. or whatever. So there were a lot of issues not just the front end in terms of finding a, a flight and booking it or finding a hotel and booking it, but also um, in terms of uh, the post-sales services and, and customer support and all of that. Um, it was also a very interesting time. Make My Trip and Guaybibo were merging. Ah. So this was also a time for them to completely rethink and revamp. Uh, minus the earlier pressures where Guai Bibo was actually kind of kind of making them run a lot more. Right. So they did not really have time for a product and design and tech revamp of any sort. So so this was like a landmark moment where they say, okay, we can breathe easy now. We can start to focus on sort of meaningful commissions and numbers and all of that, rather than just being like discounts and deals and deals and discount, because that at some point has to stop. Right. It's bleeding the company. So right. So I think this was a very good timing the way I saw it. And that's how I jumped in to, to this one. Um, true to their promise, I think they pretty much made sure that, you know, this did happen. We did. Uh, so I've done this talk multiple times before called the Ship of Theseus Guide to Redesign, <laughs> which is that 
because there were so many people who were there in Make My Trip who have been with the brand for such a long time, um, you know, they had their own territories and everything else. You had to tread a little more carefully. They were all aligned. They were all aligned to the idea of MMT. But there's also, if you think about it, each one is like a company in its own way. Right. Like flights is a company, hotels is a company and so on. But I think everyone pulled through. And uh, we did small experiments, made it bigger. We had, a, we had a grand vision of what it should be. But we did not implement it on day one. It took us two years to get it done. We actually did the other way around where we said, which of you guys want to... So there was that whole thing, hey, listen, if you implement a new piece of design in, let's say, flights, and you don't do it in hotels, it's going to be disaster, huh. right? And I think my logic was that anyway, they were all looking different. There was so much inconsistency that we were living with. Flights anyway look different from hotels. International flights anyway look different from domestic flights. It's okay. We can live for a couple of more years with a lot of dissonance and lots of broken stuff. Right. But I think the pressure for me was that when I was joining Make My Trip, a lot of my peers, my friends, my classmates said, oh my God, this guy <laughs> is like gone. He is, won't be, I mean, Make My Trip will not change. The design is so old fashioned. Look at Clear Trip, all of that. So, Interestingly, when I joined, uh, there was someone called Mohit Gupta and uh, he was then the COO. Uh, he went on to become a co-founder at Zomato later. And I think we would have this conversation about the various design philosophies and all of that. And technically, or the lack of design philosophy within Make My Trip. And he had a very interesting um, way of looking at it. He said, if you think about it, Make My Trip is your friendly neighborhood Kirana guy. He, uh -huh. You will talk to him in Hindi. He will give you a discount. His shop is a little all over the place. It's not nicely done. It is not a supermarket, but he will know that you need this. If you ask him for to pay later, he will help you do that. If you ask him for a discount, he will give you a discount. You wanted this at 10 uh -huh. o'clock in the night. I was closing, but okay, I'll open the shutter again and... So he was be that sort of a thing, unpolished, theek hai, but sab kuch hai. Store mein sab kuch mil jayega. And his thing was that when you look at a clear trip or some of the other foreign brands, they are the suited, booted guy who's saying, I work only 10 to 5. After that, I won't kind of do that. Right. Not that they are always at customer service, but it's, it's almost like that little kind of, so where is the happy balance? Where can I... And this is where the, what came in, uh, and I remember talking to Deep about it, was this notion of um, of putting the my back into make my trip. And uh, so so the thought was that, you know, make my per trip doesn't have personalization. Hmm. I mean, and it's a, it's a simple thing. I mean, it's not rocket science anymore. Um, if you bought a plane ticket, if you had an intent, you were surfing, if I know you from different... Uh, interactions, I can personalize your journey so much. Also, the notion which was very kind of which I keep thinking about a lot is that, especially in travel, I mean, you would have various modes. You are someone who's traveling with a bunch of friends. You are someone who's traveling with your wife and kids. You are someone who's going on a business trip. Now, these are three very different journeys, all within one app. So, but the hotels will be different. The flights might be the same. I think the choices of your mode may also be different. Maybe mm. you can go with bus in, in one case. Maybe you would definitely take the flight in the other, so on and so forth. Right? So, so I think those were the ways in which we had to slice and dice and understand different users, their needs, or the same user but different needs at different points in time. Mm -hmm. And this was actually kind of going into the depth of, of all of this planning sort of to think. Oh my God. So personalization how do you put the buy back into make my trip and um, i'm sure the results were amazing right because now i still feel that um, especially in the travel uh, segment that make my trip has got the best user interface uh, personally i feel that it's still very intuitive and you know you can go ahead and and obviously the services have also improved in that sense so right um, no, that's always great to hear. And I think what Make My Trip also has done is brought in a lot more like the trip money and uh, various other things. So it's, it's all coming together very well. Um, also, Make My Trip always had this interesting ones that they would pull off. Things like uh, zero cancellation Yes. if your trip changes. So I think those, they're, they're very business savvy. So they bring in those kind of things. Right. 
So now if you have, they have a lock your price um, sort of mode. Huh. Now the lock your price is how do you explain lock your price? I mean, you have had this. Uh, also, I think some of the other things that we have to deal with constantly is complexity introduced by airlines or hotels and so on. Airlines are probably a classic case. Earlier, if you remember 15, 20 years ago, you just booked a flight, either it was business class or economy and you went. Now you will have a premium economy and a flexi fare and do you want to sit near the loo or do you want to just stand and the, go yeah. or do you want to put your bag upstairs or whatever. So, I mean, you have suddenly five classes of tickets in economy and three classes of ticket here and seven. So, the complexity is increasing and therefore, design has to do a lot more wet lifting in terms of finding the right balance right. out there. Right. That was amazing, Jay. Uh, amazing. You have shared some of the most amazing experiences <laughs> with our audience. Thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to venture into one of the more disruptive pieces now, which is basically the large language models, the LLMs. Um, there are a lot of talks about LLM taking over the jobs of programmers. Um, in a lot of sectors, we have also seen that uh, with the advent of AI, uh, some of the process-based jobs have actually gone away. Right. Um, I also know that there are a lot of new releases, some of them which Adobe has done and then Microsoft has done. Some of the other companies have also released um, AI tools for design. Yeah. Right. And uh, you have Miro, you have um, Adobe's uh, Photoshop and the whole creative design suit which they are coming up with has not now got a lot of AI aspect to it. Yeah. You have got a lot of AI generators, you know, generative AI which will actually build posters for you. They will build a lot of other things which you can, yeah. you know. And it's all text based as if you True. enter a few things and then the whole thing comes up. Yeah. Um, you can give the guidelines itself, you know, how do you want it and then what's your take? Do you think that maybe not now, but in future, let's say five to six years from now, LLM would be in the AI would be in that position wherein uh, they would take up some of the design jobs. So, no, I think this is this has been the hot topic, the the major one, and every conference wants to talk about AI and so on. Generative AI definitely has put the, the creative community in a flutter, like will it replace X and will it replace Y and so on. Um, the way I say it is that there was already a democratization of design piece happening for some time now. So if you look at some of the Apple software like Keynote and, and others, they've been trying to make, like, can I make the Excel more designerish kind of, or Word more designerish or presentations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if you look at Canva, Canva took it many steps further. And um, this is not the realm of, of really Adobe and, and uh, because there's this very, very uh, professional, high-end professional sort of editing and other stuff. But they were what, what Canva was saying is that, hey, can I make a lot of those high-quality stuff available to people who are not necessarily designers that have no design training per se? Um, and I think continuing in this trend, what we see with generative AI is suddenly saying, hey, you can do so many things, which was completely out of your league uh, so far. So one thing is you will probably see a lot more well-designed documents and well-designed images and well-designed presentations and all of that. And I've been playing around with quite a few of these. What I realized is that um, two things. One is that you can get certain things done much faster and then you can say I don't like this and you can get another thing done and so on um, overall. The other thing is that sometimes what is missing is the context mm. and some of them look very same or very similar. Suddenly you begin to say oh it's done by AI and when that that thing starts to wear off like oh it's done by AI then it's like oh my god so much of AI right. Uh, of course AI will try and differentiate itself so that it doesn't look like AI per se. Like if you've seen the new one with the video and uh, from from Chat GPT and yeah. all, so that looks kind of fresh. But there is certain certain amount of um, uh, what should I say? Certain visual signature which kind of comes through AI. Having said that, I think 
pretty smart enough that in a year or two un- all of that will also disappear so mm. we will probably be looking at something completely from fresh so the question here is what do designers and do uh, i was giving a talk earlier at another conference and i was talking about the whole ai piece and um, talked about how so there's been a bunch of surveys done and all of it the common thing is that very senior people senior to very senior people this is people with 15 18 20 years of experience plus they are very very optimistic about ai because they're looking on the productivity angle a lot more whereas the younger workers who have been maybe a year or two years or about to graduate into the job they are the ones who are extremely pessimistic or extremely scared about the whole advent of ai and which is understandable because ai does a lot of the grunge work initially that they would have done much faster with lot more right yeah is there something specific some special preparations um or something some specific skill change do you see among the current set of designers to cope with this i definitely think that they have to kind of become much more attuned so one is of course being able to actively listen to what's happening listen to the markets the business the context in which they are working they're creating the work because very often they will go into i like this so i did this but what is what is the output what is the outcome that we want and how is this helping you in that now ai is still not going to solve that for you at best ai can create certain things and ai can say hey if you did this then this would happen but it will also provide you with standard pattern based answers what you're looking for is pattern breakers which is how do you personalize how do you individualize how do you take a brief or how do you extract a brief when there is no brief and how do you actually sort of really do your best to answer that brief mm-hmm. or answer that problem statement overall right so that is i think one thing that we have to wake up and do much more much sharper if you're not doing it already i mean it's an expectation but i don't think we do a great job of it and we are a little afraid of business afraid of numbers all of that but we got to embrace all of those for sure uh the other is definitely thinking more in terms of text and not just design as in not visuals uh, enough because text is what gives you context mm. text is very important and uh, very often designers design without the textual context and content and this is this is very very important embracing all of that i think being curious is always important in design but i think being even more curious and connecting more dots will become very very, very imperative important. so this would be some of the things i would talk about right jay uh, you are not only a design leader but you are also a founder of um, one of the biggest um, design conferences in southeast asia which is design up uh, i understand it's one of the biggest meeting ground for all the designers uh, what prompted you to initiate this like what was the intent right i think uh, it's a it's a longish story but to to keep it short um 2016 um we started design up and we had a small gathering of people 230 people the fun part was that the attendees if you take attendee numbers as a as a benchmark it almost doubled year on year right. till 2019 so in 2016 we started with 230 people by 2019 we had 1600 paid attendees and over 400 people who came for various exhibits and stuff which is which was not paid part of it so which is which was a huge number and we also had conferences in singapore and other places and smaller meetups so that year we probably did like 2000 3000 i mean 2000 plus i'm mean almost 2500 attendees across multiple events per show per se now what has what's happened what's been the thought behind it was to create a conference that i really want to go to and when i say that i'm a big conference buff and i've been i've spoken at a lot of conferences in india and abroad and have attended a lot more conferences and and all across and i used to be part of um, a lot of the large ones which would keep traveling different parts of the world so i'm i'm a big conference junkie conference buff and i felt that there was not enough firstly there was not enough conferences in india and not good conferences or not great conferences in india 
I mean, the ones which were there were very enterprise UX focused or or enterprisey in nature. Some of them were very academic in nature, even though it was meant for a more commercial sort of a thing. Um, so I think the first thing was that hey, I got to create something which would be unique, something which I like, and the question is, what do I like? And coincidentally, or and very sadly, that year one of my teachers, uh, M P Ranjan, uh, he passed away. Oh. And M P Ranjan would always say that uh, he was he was from Chennai originally, he spent his life in Ahmedabad, and uh, sometimes he, as students, would crib to him, and uh, so he would say, "Tu kya karega? Huh. Cribbing is not going to help you, right? Tu karega kya?" And when it's very Chennai Hindi kind of, he would say that. And so I think this had been festering in my mind for a long time that I need to create one. I need to create one. And then it just suddenly what saying like, yeah, he would say that. Like, tu karega kya kind of. So this is also the sort of the trigger. I said that if you got to do it, you got to do right. it. So put a date, put a time, put a structure. This is what I want to see. And I'm also a big believer in bringing. So it UX is of course uh, one of our major pillars. But it has to draw from various other places, because UX by itself is not independent and kind of unique in its own way. It is interdependent on so many other areas. So mm-hmm. there should be researchers and writers and you know recruiting and team building and you know CEOs and metrics and you know how do you measure what is good, what is not good. Uh, so I think we did all of that. So it was an amalgamation. We had CEOs and VCs and uh, engineers. And interestingly, DesignUp has now got close to twenty five percent attendees are non designers. Wow. So which is which it means is a lot of people are coming in there for a very cross connected experience. This year we had two doctors even attending. So this oh, year amazing. last year. <laughs> right. so, yeah. Cool. This was so great uh, to hear, and um, Jay, uh, to be very honest, it was pleasure having you here. The perspectives which you have given us, especially about the whole design ecosystem, uh, it's so amazing and enriching. Um, I'm very sure if people who would be watching this podcast and have you know interest in design field, they would definitely you know get a lot of lot out of it. Thank you. Thanks for your time, and it was pleasure having you. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks it was a pleasure being on this and and yeah, sharing little bits of what I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah.